Hey everyone, this is Erica Lucas, your host and founding member of VEST, an organization connecting women across industries, regions, and career levels, so that together we can expedite the pipeline of more women in positions of power and influence. Welcome to another episode of the Vester Podcast, where we explore the invisible barriers holding women back in the workplace and share stories of women building power collectively. There is this kind of cultural reckoning with capitalism and like patterns of white supremacy, which is, hey, capitalism values all of our worth in terms of our utility and our productivity. And where are the pain points in that? And how do, you know, I think kind of the business motto is like work smarter and not harder, right? So while others might see it as uh, this sort of laziness, I think it's more like, oh no, like, let me take a step back and realize that like, I can kind of work on the things that I'm passionate about. If I'm not passionate about it, like maybe I don't do it because like I can pursue the things I'm passionate about growing up in a hobby economy where there are ways to make, have like so many side gigs and um, create revenue for yourself with those side gigs. Just growing up with that option alongside this, um, just re- kind of, again, reckoning with what is the worth of human time um, and human energy. Uh, Yeah, I think that's where the kind of the misconception lies of like, oh, they're lazy, they don't care, um, they don't want to work. But in reality, I think it's like, well, the point of life isn't necessarily to work and why should I contribute my time to a system that isn't watching out for me or taking care of me? In this episode, we talked to Nadia Okamoto, co-founder of August, creator with over 4 million followers, and Gen Z marketing expert about how we can better understand, support, and leverage Gen Z in the workplace. Nadia's fresh perspective comes from her own experiences and expertise in understanding Gen Z's mindset and motivations. Together, we challenge the stereotypes and preconceived notions about Gen Z's approach to work, and we explore the real-life dynamics of this tech-savvy and socially conscious generation. Special thanks to VEST member Perrin Clore Duncan for moderating the session. For Nadia's and Perrin's full bios and show notes, go to www.vesther.co forward slash podcast. This episode is sponsored by Audible, the leading provider of audiobooks, podcasts, guided wellness programs, theatrical performances, and more. They have over a thousand titles for you to choose from, including our guest book, Period Power. Go to www.audibletrial.com forward slash best her and get a 30 day free trial plus a free credit to use on Nadia's book. This recording was part of a more intimate coaching session with best members and has been repurposed to accommodate this episode. So it is a huge, massive, it gives me chills, honor to just to have you here today, Nadia. Um, I know the women on this call are super excited as well. And so if we can just jump right in and have you tell a little bit more about yourself, um, maybe what isn't in your bio or something that you wanted to expand on in your bio, uh, your company, and really just your experience being a Gen Z and marketing to Gen Zs. Yeah. um, Hi, everybody. I'm Nadia. I'm based in New York. Something not in my bio is that I'm also a dog mom. And uh, I'm definitely part of that wave of dog parents that completely humanizes their pet. Um, And uh, yeah, I would consider myself a Gen Z elder, because if you talk to any of my um, uh, like middle school team members or community members, they definitely think of me as an elder. Um, and so, so yeah, I would say that I'm excited to be here to talk just kind of entrepreneurial experience. Um, I, I also think that's something to bring up a lot is that Gen Z is only until like age, like 13 right now. So kind of the rising wave of when we talk about like youth is now Gen Alpha. Which is so interesting. And uh, Erica, whenever she reached out to me, she was like, are you a Gen Z parent? And uh, I was like, well, I'm not, um, but I'm on the cusp of 
kind of millennial Gen Z. I'm 28 years old. And so um, it's funny how those are blocked off of like, here we are in this generation. And then here's the next one. There's got to be some overlap. And I think that um, so much of what is talked about and the myths surrounding Gen Z culture, I can relate to in some ways. I'm going to go through four myths and ask a question following the myth, Nadia, and just hear your perspective on it. The first myth is that Gen Z is lazy and lacks work ethic. How does this stereotype overlook the unique qualities and contributions that you believe Gen Z brings to the workplace? Yeah, so I would say that um, uh, I, you know, obviously I'll answer these questions from like my own understanding, but I think you can't really make too many generalizations over like a whole very diverse generation. Um, But uh, so wanted to caveat all my answers with that. But I would say that... um, Gen Z, uh, sociologically, in terms of like trends of beliefs, I think that there's this attitude of um, expecting a certain amount of efficiency and ease because we've grown up with things like social media and tech enabled tools, or like even thinking about groceries. I haven't actually gone to a grocery store in weeks because I can just get it delivered to my door, right? So I think that there's this expectation of a certain level of ease when we've grown up with tools that have things delivered to our door, um, have next day delivery is like a very uh, realistic thing for kind of any thing you would want in the world. Um, and so I would say that's one part of it, um, of, ex- of kind of like frustration with uh, things that don't move so quickly. I would also say there's this kind of um, uh, kind of this wall that's been hit around not having faith in the systems that govern us to work properly, right? Like, I think that it's, some people might see it as like laziness, but I would actually recontextualize that as um, kind of this belief that the systems that are governing us or that we exist in are broken and it's, you know, could be or could not be our job to fix them. Um, And so I don't think that it's like an apathy that has them resigned to just like accepting it. It's just recognizing like, oh, this situation is not working. um, And I'm either going to choose to participate or not to participate. Um, I think that that you see a lot of that kind of frustration in politics, um, in educational institutions. um, And I, I mean, even for me as someone who I would consider myself like politically engaged as like a young uh, citizen. Like I do not have a reaffirmed faith that like the government is protecting my reproductive rights or is something that I should like trust and be involved in, right? Like, I mean, I'm kind of the extreme of it where like I ran for public office in 2017 and rather that making me want to get more involved, it made me kind of say, actually, I don't think this is working and I need to figure out a different way to make change. Um, and then I would say on the work ethic side, I think it's a it, it's definitely a mix, right? I think it's a mix of um, expecting that efficiency, not having so much patience for systems that aren't um, optimized. But I would also say there is this kind of cultural reckoning with capitalism and like patterns of white supremacy, which is, hey, capitalism values all of our worth in terms of our utility and our productivity. And where are the pain points in that? And how do, you know, I think kind of the business motto is like work smarter and not harder, right? So while others might see it as uh, this sort of laziness, I think it's more like, oh no, like, let me take a step back and realize that like, I can kind of work on the things that I'm passionate about. If I'm not passionate about it, like maybe I don't do it because like I can pursue the things I'm passionate about growing up in a hobby economy where there are ways to make, have like so many side gigs and um, create revenue for yourself with those side gigs. Um, I think like kind of the hobby economy is made possible by growing up with things like task rabbit and uh you know uber driving and like these various things that you can kind of make money to be able to do the things that you really like to do and i think just growing up with that option alongside this um just re- kind of again reckoning with what is the worth of human time um and human energy uh yeah i think that's where the kind of the misconception lies of like oh they're lazy they don't care um they don't want to work but it, in reality i think it's like well, the point of life isn't necessarily to work. And why should I contribute my time to a system that isn't watching out for me or taking care of me? 
Oh, yes. And that's something that I think is so difficult to deal with because you're battling um, this mindset and this culture that has existed and persisted for so long. And I feel, you know, not just Gen Z, but but anyone who who values the fact that life isn't just about work and looks at ways to create, um, you know, value and and uh, a means for living in different ways and and strategizes. It's like it's it's funny that we call it lazy when it's actually just being creative to allow for a life that's more beautiful. So uh, thank you for those answers, Nadia. And the next question or myth that we're sort of unpacking is that Gen Z is overly dependent on technology and lacks face-to-face communication skills. Um, in your in your experience, how does technology actually empower Gen Z in the workplace, and how do they navigate the balance between virtual and in person interactions? Yeah, I would say like I think that I'll, I'll first and foremost say like every single day, the more and more I talk to like my peers and people who are younger than me, it just reaffirms that like Gen Z is like a walking contradiction slash paradox on all things, right? It's this like I feel the tension of fuck social media. It's like been the bane of my existence and the cause of so many insecurities and mental health problems that I have. It's absolutely addictive. But also social media has enabled literally everything in my life. It's where I've met all my friends. It's probably how y'all have heard, you know, if you know about me or of my work, have heard it. It has made me financially independent since I was 12 years old. It's the way my sister's putting herself through college. It's the way that I've found community beyond like in the times when I felt the most alone. Um, and, uh, I would say that like so much of my activism, especially in politics actually has been made possible by social media and the technology that we have. Right. And so I, I also, I think it's really interesting when that documentary, the social, um, the, the social network came out and there was kind of this like gen x gen y oh my gosh, what's happening with our data and the algorithm is like manipulating us when for me, it's like, and a lot of my peers, I think we watch it and we were like, okay, yeah, like we know, right? Data privacy is not something that we're concerned about because we've never expected data privacy, you know? And I think that um, I think that that's been honestly like a huge part of what we've been, um, you know, thinking about a lot. Um, and so I would say that, you know, technology, again, it is a central part of my life. It is something where like, this is the way we communicate. And I would say for me as a Gen Z elder, my interactions with social media also is so different than like my sister. My sister is five years younger than me. She does not use iMessage. She only uses Snapchat in replace in replacing text, right? Like she doesn't use um like she doesn't use like uh you know in general like find my friends on iPhone. She uses Snap Maps, right? And so to, for me, she always makes fun of me for being like much older because like I use iMessage, right? And so I think that even in the way that we think about, there is no expectation for data privacy. There is not really a concern for it, um, I think for the most part, because that is something that like we've grown up with and the benefits that it has brought to our lives are probably very much exceed um, the things that are harsher. Um, but I would say, you know, it does it negatively and have negative impacts? Absolutely. Is there a lack of accountability in some of the ways that it's encroaching on our lives? Absolutely. Um, and so I think that there's definitely a lot of growing edges um, to work through. And um, uh, but again, it's enabled so much of our lives. And like, I don't see a world in which like we get rid of it, right? Like, I mean, even with the discussions around banning TikTok, I don't think that's going to happen given that there's way too much money in it for American corporations um, and like uh, the creator economy. Um, But also if you get rid of TikTok, it just like Meta is right there trying to compete with Instagram Reels. So is Google with YouTube Shorts. Snapchat has Spotlight. It's purely not a a situation where we're toning down um, data protection or anything like that. If anything, banning something like TikTok will just open the door and space for um, another uh, an, another algorithm to kind of take over our lives. And it's, it's very much because we do live in the time of an attention economy. Thanks so much for sharing that perspective. And it's so interesting hearing, you know, even just the difference between 
your younger sister and Snapchat is so hilarious to me because I feel like Snapchat was something that I used in high school. And then I, it kind of became obsolete for me. And I don't really know why sometime in college, I just stopped using it. But the fact that the younger generation, that's what they use instead of iMessage um, is super fascinating. One thing that I just want to ask as a follow-up, Nadia, to that is, do you ever feel a sense that um, generations younger than us will lose the ability to have really meaningful in-person face-to-face interactions and they'll rely solely on social media and and virtual interactions to facilitate community? Um, sorry, can you, do you, do you mean like, do I think they will ever move away from it or kind of tools on community building? Yeah, I mean, I think, and sorry, the way I phrase that question is a little bit confusing, but I think my fear is that people will no longer be interested in face-to-face interactions and they'll only resort to interactions online. But I'm just curious what your perspective is on that. Um, Do you think that we're moving towards communities that will, will be really centralized and focused in the virtual realm? Or do you think there will still always be place for authentic face-to-face. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I have kind of an interesting take on this because I, I actually would say, and again, I am not like a sociological academic. This is just purely from my own, um, uh, kind of my own theories of it. I think that there's actually more of an emphasis on community and in person because we live in such a digital world. So like, I mean, I'm sure you've seen like the big hot new buzzword in the marketing world has been like community, right? And August very much like we raised $2 million of a pre-seed round, pre-launch, pre-product because we said, hey, we have this authentic Gen Z community that we built on this new app called Geneva, which is like Slack for Gen Z. But like there are all these community oriented consumer social apps that are being funded with the intention of we are creating real community spaces in a very digital world where people are becoming more and more isolated. And so I would say that in response to the pandemic and to social media, like as it fosters this online sense of community, it heightens this level of like digital, like real realistic isolation. And so I think that even in the world of like funding consumer social, a lot of what you're seeing the trends of is investing in groups that are all about, or startups that are all about like more in-person community, like more small community conversations. Um, And I was actually just talking about this like with um an investor of mine where like she was asking like what happens to live theater right now and I was like well actually I think that TikTok and social media has completely enabled like the resurgence of fandom around Broadway right like this is where Broadway music has become like something you see on video um and something that people are talking about a lot more than they were before but also it puts like a higher value on seeing in person because like it's kind of the scarcity over like, it feels more rare. Um, And so I would say that like that in in conjunction with like, even if you see like the emphasis on like experiential things and all of that, I think it has kind of put a larger value on it, but it's definitely a pendulum, right? Which is that um, we definitely like don't expect in person as much as possible, as much. Um, But I also think that to me, I, I'm thankful for it because the whole like, oh, this meeting could have been an email. Now it's like, oh, this meeting could have been like a Zoom call, you know? And so I think that it's just like a, a again, like a different expectation of efficiency. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so the the next question or myth is that Gen Z has a short attention span is, and is easily distracted at work. Um how do you believe that Gen Z's ability to multitask and consume information quickly actually benefits organizations? Um, and how can employers leverage that skill? This is a great question and one I love chatting about. Um, so yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a myth that the attention span is small. Like that is like data driven, like fact that the attention span of 
like Gen Z as a whole is I think on average eight seconds, which is shorter than a literal goldfish. Um, so I would say that it's that that's not necessarily a myth. I think that I would rather use the word like misunderstanding of how you interpret that fact, right? Like to me, attention span is not like attention span is eight, like eight seconds taking that number of like how long I'm going to potentially like offer my um, evaluation of whether or not something is worth my time, right? So rather than thinking, oh, so these people, like this generation can only focus on one thing for like eight seconds at a time. I think it's more so like you have eight seconds. Um, honestly, eight seconds is a lot to convince me that what you're trying to get me to think about or do is worth my time um, and justify that, right? Because think about it, like we're also the generation that will sit down and wait in uh hours and hours and hours of a line for like a new shoe drop right we're also going to sit down and like watch 12 hours of tv and binge watch netflix for like days in a row and um or even from like an attention span thing like all people will spend hours on tiktok which is one platform however the speed at which it moves and i think like the evaluation of what i'm going to watch that's where it's like eight seconds to convince me that it's worth it, right? It's the same thing as like, if you think about scrolling, like we've grown up on the, these platforms where you're scrolling, right? So if I scroll within two seconds, I'm like boring, go, boring, boring, until I see something that's like kind of eye catching and then I'll watch the whole thing, right? I think Netflix too, like we've grown up with these, with, by the way, not just one, so many streaming services, each of which are completely oversaturated with content. And so I think it's more so like living in an attention economy, I have more than enough options. And so the um, kind of like the need to engage or kind of keep engaged is like at a higher level of expectation. I think how this comes to life in the workplace is very much also like there is a higher level of expectation on like wanting to do work that you can justify either in advancing your career or like something you're genuinely interested in right and so I think that that's where um you know some of the uh discussion around like um uh you know, a lot of people say like the administrative work and all of these things. It's not that Gen Z won't do it, but I think that there's this kind of expectation that like I am understanding that I am doing this work that I might not like doing because I can justify the end goal of it, but I need to understand that end goal. So how I think of this in our workplace is like, you know, even with August as we're, we hire a lot of Gen Z, right? Like I am 25, I'm, uh, I'm not the youngest on the team, um, but it's just like, there's kind of a deeper need for transparency so that obviously people aren't going to always love the work that they're doing. There are a lot of administrative tasks that more so like junior team members will be doing. But a lot of that, I think you keep people engaged by saying the reason you're doing this work is not just because of like what you're trying to achieve, but how it levels up to the larger picture of what we're trying to work on. Right. And I think that that's, that is a new Gen Z expectation. And I think that there's this intergenerational like tension sometimes in workplaces that I've seen, like even in my prior consulting work around like, um, you know, this Gen Z expectation that not everybody uh, thinks is you know, deserved or valid around wanting to wanting more business transparency, I think is the best way to put it of like wanting more understanding of like the larger business picture beyond just like, why am I putting things in an envelope to send out like needing to understand like how that levels up into the larger impact. Well, and Nadia on the panel um, that you did recently for fortune. I think. Uh, yes, I think so. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I don't want to say it wrong, but you talked about how um, you all intentionally set up time. I think you're called heart checks. I love that because I, I feel that um, that can help untap potential of any individual if they feel seen and understood. And And so would you just talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah, so um, I would say that heart checks are something that we implemented super early on in the company. And I think a lot of it is that, you know, kind of what we were talking about around the trend of um, expecting a higher level of transparency, I would say right up there is like accountability, right? I think that we've always um, historically in large workplaces have 
a, like HR or methods where people can give feedback. But I think that what we really saw, honestly, in 2020, especially in the world of corporate responsibility, was this accountability of like people feeling not heard, whether it be around social issues or any, you know, just like kind of trials and tribulations of capitalism, right? And so I think that a lot of it is um, is is saying like, hey, we're investing time. We don't owe you feedback, um, but we're giving you feedback, and we deserve to have options to hold you accountable. And like, we want to see those changes. And I think that um, kind of in response to that need for a higher level of accountability and transparency was this: oh shit, we need to create like intentional time where we're just like really thinking critically about that feedback that we can really show up with action steps and like they know that we really value that feedback and that like we will act on it and we take it very seriously. But I think also like knowing that for a lot of our team members, this is their first job out of college, you know, understanding like what are hierarchical structures of power and reporting, right? And so um, I think that it can be really intimidating to receive even like an employment contract with a bunch of legal jargon you've never heard of before. And so just trying to create space where they can ask and talk about uncomfortable things, right? Like I'm from an Asian household that grew up with financial instability. Talking about money is very uncomfortable. Now imagine someone who's like, like that, but then hasn't grown up in a business space. This is their first job talking about money and equity and trying to understand stock options can be very you know, confusing. And so I think a lot of the goal of Heart Checks was like, how do we bring that level of transparency to say like, what is what are the questions that you haven't answered? What are the things you, you wanna give feedback on? And what are the things you need to see more accountability on? And what questions do you have in terms of salary, compensation, high, like structure, um, you know, ownership of workflows, uh, even your contract, like anything, what are the things that you have questions on that you might be um, uncomfortable to ask in like a larger setting, but like really, really, in, in, uh, intentionally creating space for those. Thanks so much, Nadia. Um, yeah, I think sometimes it's just giving people permission to speak about things that they're not sure if they can talk about, you know, and um, I feel like I would love to be a part of fostering workplaces that we can talk about virtually anything that relates to our work, especially when it relates so heavily to our work. Uh, yeah. And that kind of goes straight into uh, the next myth or misconception about Gen Z yeah. and that it is only motivated by financial reward and lacks loyalty to employers. Um, how do you feel like Gen Z hungers for new expectations uh, to help improve ways of evolving the workplace to benefit um, not just women, but everyone and um, yeah, kind of unpack that that misconception for us yeah um I think that a lot of it is you know um yeah I saw one of the questions I'll contextualize this also in answering one of the questions in the chat which is around like this generation being like overly sensitive and all these things I think it comes back to like the expectation of like we deserve and should have always deserved as people like more flexibility. And I think that we are a burnt out global community. Like, you know, I think that it it, it is uh, realizing that the politics, the business, these structures living in these systems is harmful and that like we, it is very personal too, right? And so I think that a lot of the expectation to see more transparency, to see more change in these structures is honestly due to, I think the, um, I think to, to kind of hitting this brink as a society of burnout and harm that has been done um, that needs to be rectified as a really big part of it. Thank you so much. And, and that kind of reminds me going back to earlier, Nadia, you mentioned that you ran for political office. First of all, thank you for choosing to do that. Um, someone recently said, like, we need to ask women to run because sometimes people just aren't asked or encouraged. And I, I feel that balance and challenge of how can I create the most change or the change that I want to to see sometimes it's not going to look like participating in the traditional systems but at the same time we need thought leaders like you to go in and 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 lead um and switch up some of the mindsets that we've just allowed to exist that that continue to cause harm in our communities so 
pretty soon we're going to open up to additional questions from the audience. But one other thing, Nadia, that I would love to hear your perspective on, and this is not necessarily just for Gen Z, but I think there's a challenge um, that we have often, you know, a social cultural challenge as language shifts and inclusive language shifts. And I was reading um, an article that you've probably seen uh, about you from the the New York Post that talks about how you're like using menstruators instead of women, and that's totally excluding your your target yeah. audience and. And I feel in a woman wrote that, um, that article and in my mind, um, she, you know, she, she kind of explains in the article that she feels you dehumanized the people that your products are benefiting, but, but in my mind, and, and I think probably, um, you're, you're giving, um, you're humanizing the fact that not just people who identify as women, um, menstruate. And so anyway, I just would love to hear your perspective on how you handle and, um, and think about how language is constantly shifting and how do you meet people where they're at, um, and, and really just continue to encourage greater inclusivity in the way we talk, um, and think. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so <laughs> I get a lot of backlash, I think the most from other cis women when I try to push for gender inclusivity in um, the period space. I think it's typical, I don't know if you guys have heard like the like the term TERFs, but it's like, you know, just very transphobic, trans exclusive people who consider themselves feminists. And um, I think that, you know, I think to me, I find the backlash very, uh, I find it very motivating because to me, it's just like further proof that we have so much more work to do. Um, I think that you probably see the same understanding around like the Black Lives Matter conversation where there's this misunderstanding that like being more inclusive creates is like taking taking away space for like an existed existing community that's already included. I think that that kind of scarcity mindset is like very capitalism based, which is like, oh, there's only so much space for people to have like basic rights. So like if an, a marginalized community gets more rights, it's taking away from existing rights rather than thinking, no, we're just elevating the ex expectation for everybody. And so I think where that comes from is this belief that like, Oh, what on one side, let's not use gender inclusive language because by saying trans men can menstruate, you're taking away the um uh empowerment that cis women can feel because they menstruate, which is just like not true at all, right? Like we would all honestly, I think cis women would benefit the most from separating womanhood from menstruation because it means that we're more than just you know birthing bodies. And I also think that like there's this misunderstanding that like. I'm not calling someone a menstruator because they're like a terminator and they're only like robot ro robotic purposes to have a period, which is where I think like some of these like journalists like Fox News will be like, oh, they're like simplifying womanhood to like having a period like no menstruator just became this nickname that like kind of this space and this movement has been using because like what better fun term is there to have a gender inclusive word that can encapsulate the experience of having a period while also recognizing that people who menstruate aren't always women right they might identify as non-binary or trans and actually it is rather harmful to tell like a 12 year old girl once they get a period oh now you're a woman right because it literally contextualizes the ability to give birth as like the single change for womanhood and I think that that's where there's a lot of misunderstanding and there's a lot of personal feelings and backlash. Um, and it's really interesting because like, you know, there's the, there are these, um, you know, again, the misconception around Gen Z being like overly sensitive, like talk about overly sensitive is like, honestly, like the Gen X turfs out there who like find it so fucking triggering um, when you use gender inclusive or like inclusive language in general. And so I think that like a lot of what the pushback like it doesn't that kind of pushback doesn't get to me because it just like to me 
it makes me feel like, oh, you know, like we're really hitting a nerve. Like we're making change because people who've never encountered the idea of gender inclusivity or gender fluidity are finally hearing this conversation. And like, that's what needs to happen. I love that. And, and I love how you can just take it with a sense of humor too, because sometimes it's, it's just not worth getting upset about things. It's like people are going to be where they're at. I want to give time for some of the great questions that have been popped into the chat. And Kristen, I know you had to um, just come up and I'm not sure if you wanted to come off the uh, mute and ask them. Hi, Nadia. I'm in San Francisco, um, originally from Oklahoma, which is why I'm here. And I work with companies as a consultant, founder, CEOs, and I found some of them, they're usually like series C, D, E, um, sometimes after going public. But I found myself wondering, I, the stereotype is Gen Z loves starting companies, right? But for companies that want to recruit Gen Z that have already been around for four or five years, already have 50, 100 employees, what draws them to work for one company over another? And, and also, what would what would motivate them to stay? And then I have a personal question as the mother of a 20 year old son. Um, what makes an older person interesting <laughs> to a Gen Z? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I would say that uh, I think that in many ways it kind of goes back to this paradox, right? Which is like, I wouldn't even say Gen Z likes starting companies. I just think it's like, we finally have the tools to be able to do so, right? Like when you think about what it takes to run, for example, like start a CPG brand, it's like marketing and how do you run strong digital awareness? Like who better to do that than people who've grown up on social media where it's second nature to us. So I would, rather than saying like, yeah, so that's what that, I would caveat that, but I would also say like, again, walking paradox, right? We've grown up in, in stable times. We like trying new things. We love innovation, but we also it also means we very much value stability, right? And we very much value like in a time when there are these giant tech layoffs, like there is more of an appeal. I think for a lot of my friends who like have done startups for the last five years, they're going back into corporate because they kind of want to chill and work a job that they have very much job security in. Um, and I would say that in terms of what entices them to stay is really that transparency, accountability, and like professional development standpoint, right? I think more than ever before, there's this kind of thinking of like, okay, I'm doing this now, but where is this taking me? And like wanting a clear path of, of what it takes to get there. Um, uh, but I think that accountability is huge. I think we saw this, honestly, even like for my friends who are, you know, at Goldman Sachs, who are finally talking about like the inhumane hours that they work um, there as an uh, associate investment bankers, right? I think that there's like, those hours have always been there. That work culture has always been there, but now it's kind of this reckoning of like, but it shouldn't be like that. How do we build accountability Accountability, and the way that that company can like kind of push out, uh, uh, you know, initiatives of retention is honestly to just act on that feedback, right? And like be accountable to that as well. Um, <laughs> in terms of like, I think what makes Gen X interesting is, I mean, I think Gen X is the most interesting because the things that we're dealing with right now, both from like a social perspective and otherwise are like, or the things that we learn about in class are things that like Gen, S Gen X has experienced, right? Like if you think about Black Lives Matter um, and uh, co the conversations around racial justice, right? Like talking about the civil rights movement like that's not that long ago, you know, and even everywhere we talk about like stop Asian hate and all this like AAPI inclusion, a lot of it was going back to like Japanese internment, which also was not that long ago, right? right. And the China, mm -hmm. you know, J Chinese Exclusion Act, like my grandparents were affected by that. And um, I think that a lot of uh, the things that we're looking at right now, whether it be around like geopolitics or even around digital and like how things are innovating, right? Like I think the the massive um, cultural shift we're seeing now with gen the introduction of generative AI is like kind of similar to like the crazy um, change of when like email was introduced and the text was introduced. And so I actually think that there there is this kind of like things that we're grappling with like that are not new or I wouldn't say are they are new. No, no, they are, they are really not new. Like these cultural changes, like they've happened before time and time again. And I think that kind of there is an interesting curiosity in like how 
you know, the people before us have dealt with it and otherwise. Um, and I would also say like, it's an, it's a curiosity to learn, right? I think especially around gender, like it is very hard for, I think, many generations before us to understand that gender is a social construct and like to understand like even my mom who's like a DEI consultant like we still have to like explain certain nuances around talking and respecting and creating space for transness and I think that when there's this um uh when there's express curiosity and interest to learn like we have nothing but like interest to share and talk about that um and I think Gen Z also loves to hear ourselves talk um and so I think that that's it that's that definitely is a huge part of it as well thank you awesome um thanks so much for those questions Kristen uh does anyone else you feel free to raise your hand if you have another question I know uh, Ashley had one in the chat. It was around the topic of um, uh, she would like to learn how to best support Gen Z to help reduce barriers to success. Um, so what can she do as a business owner to amplify um, Gen Zers who are trying to showcase their skills? I would say that, I mean, going back to like uplifting and like, you know, I think we hear a lot of the term like of putting your money where your mouth is, which is like, like the, my biggest pet peeve is when like business leaders or like public figures will be like, Gen Z is going to save the world, but then like nowhere in their actual work is like initiatives to invest in and support Gen Z and stay accountable to that. And so I think that kind of that theme of accountability comes up a lot around like, you know, regardless of what business you're in, if you care about like cultivating, um, you know, professional development and leadership, like what does that actually look like in terms of like how your time and resources and energy is allocated? Um, so my question is around, I currently have a Gen Z working for me. And um, first things first, I hired her. So <laughs> I kind of knew what I was getting into uh, with this. Um, and then getting to know her and seeing how she works. Um, some of my staff members and higher ups don't understand her because they haven't taken the time to get to know her. And so I'm often asked about um, you know, why is she always on her phone? You know, she doesn't seem capable of completing a job. She always seems to be out of touch or not communicating um, as much. And so while I'm consistently working to develop her and, and help her navigate um, the true professional world, um, sometimes it's a sticking point for me, but it really is a sticking point for others. How can I um, continue to help her understand um, not necessarily losing who she is, but in some sense, when you're in a professional world, how do you sort of change to navigate while also helping others seeing you as capable, if that yeah. makes sense? I think that this is where like representation really matters, um, which is that like, I think part of it is again, there are a lot of downfalls and risks with social media and like how much technology has like taken over our lives. But in many ways, I think a lot of it is like, this is where I think the importance of having role models and representation to see like what happens when, like examples of like, when you do lose trust with yourself, but also examples of like, what is it, what does it look like when you really apply, you know, and understand your potential and like what does it mean to like look at what your potential could be and explore what how you could shape shift that to what you're interested in and like what does it take to get there um I think that that's where like exposure to um and I think this is why like I'm so passionate about positive media and like creating those ways of exposing uh representation of like I mean even thinking about this right like this conversation which is like maybe in the future when there's like um someone who could be seen as a role model or something like everybody brings like a few gen z mentees that they have um so that they also have this sort of exposure um and i think that that kind of collective learning and like including people at the table when uh for for these kind of conversations is really important right i think that like one of the things i love doing whenever i'm like invited to do consulting or like speaking on gen z trends is like yes and i will bring a high school student that i work with and a middle school Schooler, so you can really see like how different we are and like um so it's not just about me but it's like it, it's really like exposing opportunities for those gen z team members and i think that like 
that kind of empowerment, but also like for our middle school team members, like they love the opportunities that August gives because it's kind of like their first foray into feeling like, wow, I can do a lot. Like I have a lot of potential. I look at what I can do with these opportunities and it kind of becomes something that um, increases their energy and their excitement and motivation around it. I love that, Nadia. And and Judy, to your point too, I think that that, um, you know, the the questions about why are they always on their phone? I've, I've heard that from... Um, actually in a recent conversation with someone I love who is um, an employer and from a generation older than me, he was explaining how much frustration he feels about one of his employees who's always on their phone. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm on my phone a lot too, but my work's on my phone as well. And um, I, I think that part of it is just getting to that understanding, Nadia. I love how you're like, bring them in, you know, bring them into the conversation just so that we can all feel like things are as fair as they can be, you know? Cause I, I think in, in some people's mind, it's like, I'm not on my phone playing candy crush or whatever, you know, I'm actually working, I'm typing. And it's like, well, actually I'm, I'm emailing people back and forth on my phone and coordinating things and, you know, texting a, a partner or whatever. And so I feel, um, yeah, thank you so much for that perspective. I think we might have time for a couple more questions. Um, I'm not sure if, it, oh, Courtney has her hand raised. Yeah, I would love to ask a question, Nadia, about brand, which, by the way, you've just knocked out of the park completely. But I think for Gen Z, obviously, like brand goes so much deeper. So I'd love to hear like your thoughts on what role does brand kind of representation play in shaping the loyalty and purchase uh purchasing decisions of Gen Z, particularly beyond those superficial kind of design elements, but also in terms of like shared values, impact initiatives, and social consciousness. Would love your thoughts on that. Um, but again, just to clarify, I'm on the site now ordering and oh. you've like knocked it out of the park uh, in both regards, but would love, love to hear your thoughts on brand and the importance there for Gen Z. Yeah. Um, well, I would say like more than ever before, it is easy to start a consumer product brand, right? Like with the uh, availability of like Alibaba, it like you literally could create a brand, white label a product, put a new packaging on it. One of my favorite business articles of like all time is this Bloomberg article called The Bland New World. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of calling out how mm -hmm. um, there's this wave of products where it's like, okay, here's like literally the direct consumer playbook find product, find cheapest option of product, find fulfillment center, you do a uh, two syllable name, have like white clean packaging with a couple color, right? And so I think that's where in a world where it is so oversaturated with consumer products and commodities and so much, brand is like literally the thing that cannot be replicated because it is like unique and soulful, right? Like, can there be another product that sells exactly what August sells? Yes. But is there another brand that is like, can be truly authentic and unique in our brand values? No, like that, to me, that's where brand is so important. I think that we see this a lot just in like the turnover of um, like what the hot new fashion brand is, right? Like, um, I think that even when you look at all of the different companies that sell athleisure, where like often they're the same freaking product made at the same manufacturer with like the same tones of colors, like the differentiate the, the differentiator there will either be price will it will be quality but if the price and the quality and the uh, you know unit economics are similar because of the product the differentiator is brand and community and so i think that like i obviously believe very much so in that but i also think that like the direct to consumer bubble has kind of popped right there was this wave of direct to consumer companies that were getting so overly funded um i think casper is a really good example where you're seeing them get really funded um and it's basically a pay to play right so on facebook you can put money into it you get customers out of it and i think that we're kind of having that bubble pop because pop because cost of acquisition was so heightened that it's like oh what are the ways that you can actually sustain and grow as a business when you don't want to be stuck in that pay to play machine, organic brand fandom, right? And so I think that's where for me, like that kind of emotional connection is so important because like, it's not that hard to start a business anymore. 
That's so good. Thank you so much for that insight, Nadia. As like a fellow founder, I think it's fascinating because just constantly like in the investment capacity, getting asked like, well, what's your differentiator? And most times we're speaking to investors who are not Gen Z or millennial. And so like organic brand fandom and just like brand sometimes doesn't seem like enough, but I do feel like just in this recent wave, we're really seeing the power of like brand and community, uh, which is exciting. So thanks so much for sharing. That's super helpful. Of course. And I, my advice would be like, uh, I, you know, we took a year and a half to raise our pre-seed round and like, yeah, saying brand, organic brand, like to many people who like don't come from a brand world and more of a numbers world, especially on the investment side, that means nothing but like, oh, so you're going to change your colors, right? The way you have to make the argument is like around cost of acquisition and like month over month growth, which is like, hey, having organic brand will give me a very low cost of acquisition, which means you have a bigger bang for your buck and that we can grow and scale in an organic way. So here are the examples in which cost of acquisition lowering helps with business growth. When you contextualize it in cost of acquisition or like ROAS or like these number things around scalability, that's where investors will get it. But you kind of need to like use that language to make the argument. So helpful. Thanks so much, Nadia. <laughs> Nadia, is there anything else that you want to share with this group of women? Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I so appreciate the time and the space. Like, obviously, I think that I'm kind of like preaching to the choir here around like we're probably all on the same page that period stigma needs to be like eradicated. Um, and I think that, you know, I love working in the space. I'm almost 10 years in. Um, and I think that like what I always encourage people to do is like recognize period stigma around your own world, right? Like easy things you can do as a business owner, like make sure all the offices stock like uh, free period products, like be more flexible about sick time or PTO around like period pain or just discussions around it. Um, and I think that just being open to those conversations and obviously I hope you try August, whether that be getting it from us online or directly in store. Um, so yeah, excited to, uh, excited to have you try and would love any feedback. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend and don't forget to leave us a review. And if you're ready to take your career to the next level, apply to join our community of professional women all eager to help you get there and stay there. Go to www.besther.co and apply today.